Yeah. You're next, Doug. Up there in the booth. Just move your tie center. No, okay. Okay. Okay, and anytime you're ready. Okay. Can you, just so we have it correct, state and spell your name as you would like to, to appear on the screen? Sure. Uh, my name is George Yoshitake. Y O S H I T A K E. Okay, great. And before I get into some more general things, I have to ask you about the very uh, specific test which I've seen footage of in which you're actually standing uh, beneath an atmospheric test, correct? That's correct. Can you tell me about that, how that came about? Well, let's see. I remember uh, w one afternoon I was at Lookout Mountain right here in Hollywood, and I got a call from a uh, Woody Mark. I think he was a major at that time, and he was in Nevada. And he said, George, or they should call me Yosh, I need you out here tomorrow for a special test. And so he said, uh, you know, catch a plane and come on out. So I did. I got there that night. And uh, what he said, uh, tomorrow morning, you're going to go out with five other guys, and you're going to be standing at ground zero. I said, ground zero? He said, yeah, but the bomb's going to go off 10,000 feet above you. I said, well, what kind of protective gear am I going to have? Well, he said, none. So I, I, ha I remember I had a, a, a hat, and so it was a baseball hat, so I wore that, just in case. But anyway, uh, he gave me a still camera, two motion picture cameras. These were IMOs, 35 millimeter IMOs. And he says, I want you to get coverage when the thing go, goes off. And so I set up the two IMOs, and I had little trip wires that I could trip it with my, my foot you know, starting at about five seconds before the blast. And the still camera, I also had a tripwire that I could trip it. I could get one exposure only. But anyway, these five were scientists, and they volunteered to do so, but I wasn't a volunteer. Uh, I didn't find out until I got there. But anyway, we went out there the early morning, and uh, sure enough, the test went off on schedule. The bomb went off at 10,000 feet. We were told not to look up when the bomb goes off, but you could look up afterwards. And so uh, I, I looked down, and I was doing my, my work of tripping the cameras. In fact, I even uh, built a sign, and I said, ground zero, population five or six. I don't remember what it was. But I remember uh, propping up that sign in front of them. And uh, when the bomb went off, uh, the, I could see the, the ground light up. And afterwards, I looked up, and uh, you could see the donut-shaped cloud that that uh, was where the bomb went off. Was this a particularly spectacular explosion to witness, or did you witness explosions that were far more uh, in incredible to look at? Oh, uh, definitely. Uh, the hydrogen bombs in the Pacific were much, much more spectacular. Uh, I'm sorry, can you rephrase that, just because we may use this in a different context, that they were the most spectacular of the all? The most spectacular I remember seeing, okay, yes. Sir, can you start from yes. that? Well, uh, but this, this one was a much smaller weapon, and so uh, it didn't create the, the big blast that you normally... I'm sorry, let, let me rephrase my question. Yes. Of all the t tests that you witnessed, what were, what, was the most, what were the most spectacular tests? The most spectacular were in the Pacific, these hydrogen bombs. They normally went off right at sunup or just before it, the sky started getting light. And uh, you had to look away at, at the initial blast. But as you look to it afterwards, you could see the mushroom cloud developing, and you could see this eerie ultraviolet glow in the cloud. And I thought that was so, so spectacular, so meaningful in terms of how powerful that bomb was that uh, I still picture that vividly in my mind. Okay. And um, going back to the, uh, um, uh, going back to the, uh, uh, the, the earlier shot, the one in Nevada. I'm sorry, what was the name for that shot? I don't remember okay. the name of that shot. <laughs> okay. it, were, was, it, uh, was it necessary to have a cameraman as one of the five, or could they have been anyone from Lookout Mountain? Well, I'm sure it could have been anyone from Lookout Mountain. Mm -hmm. But uh, Woody just had to pick me, I guess. <laughs> Is that because he liked you or because he didn't like you? <laughs> um, and you, you said you didn't remember what you were saying into the microphone, right? Uh, no, not, not during that shot. I don't remember, no. Okay. And were you scared that, I mean, I knew you wore your baseball cap, but were you scared that perhaps that was a little too close to the explosion? Well, no. I thought my only concern was that I could become sterile at uh, something that close. But I had two children after that, so I guess I'm all right. The only thing I think I blame it all is my gray hair. <laughs> okay.
Okay. And uh, in retrospect, uh, um, do you think that it, it's something that if you were, um, knowing what you know now, if you were asked to do it again, uh, w would you do it again, or do you think you would have avoided that? Assignment? I would definitely avoid it, right. <laughs> so uh, can you sort of rephrase that, knowing what you know now, or now you would... Well, well knowing how, how dangerous it could have been, uh, there's no need to take that kind of a chance, certainly you know, now at my age. Could, could you talk a little bit about the level of knowledge that, you, that all of you who were involved with the tests had about atomic uh, uh, energy and atomic weapons at that time uh, versus sort of what you know now? Did you have a complete picture of the power and so, some of the after effects, or did you learn that later? Uh, no, we learned it much later, much later. But certainly... Uh, there were several of my relatives that were that died at Hiroshima and in Nagasaki and so I knew how how terrible it can be in, uh, when one of these goes off and so uh, I had some of that foreknowledge I guess or feelings can you talk, beforehand. Can you talk a little bit more about that in terms of um, you know because you, you mentioned that again, that you had relatives that, that died in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and how did that change your approach to documenting the test? Did that give you a different outlook than other people? Uh, no, I felt that it was, these were all scientific type kind of tests, and so I, I felt that it was for the benefit of mankind to, to learn what atomic energy can do or cannot do. And so uh, I thought from that perspective that you know, I wanted to participate. Could you reiterate that again and, and just mention again your family's history with, with atomic energy? And well, let's see. I had an uncle and an aunt uh, who, who was at Nagasaki. I think they came into town that day for shopping or something. And, uh, but they lived out in the country. So if they stayed where they were at, uh, where they lived, they would probably have been okay. But coming into town is, just happened to be uh, unfortunate. So when you got into documenting those, did you think about that? No, not really. I, 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 I guess maybe it crossed my mind a little bit, but uh, I remember one test in Nevada where they brought in some pigs and, and monkeys and they propped them up, they had their eyes open and so forth. And I thought, uh, this is how people, human beings must have felt when, when the bomb went off uh, to have suffered. How about the, the other, from the other direction, could the fact that you had an uncle and an aunt who were, in, who were at Nagasaki, did that make you want to learn more and educate the world about it more? Uh, well, I was much younger then, and I don't think I was uh, that kind of, to, to try to change the world, no. What was, overall, um, what do you think was the, uh, um, the important role of those of you who were documenting these tests? What service did that provide to the testing program and to the world, therefore? Well, I think a lot of us felt that uh, th what we were doing was very important to capture the imagery of, of these atomic uh, tests and, and devices. And it, it could be down, going down in history that it could be preserved and, and so people could see what some of the terrible things that it can do or cannot do. Mm -hmm. And. What was the uh, political climate at the time? Were people resistant to these tests, and did you feel any pressures that you were involved with something that was not popular? Well, uh, Look Out Mountain, we were located up uh, Wonderland Avenue, and the neighbors thought we were building atomic bombs there, and so they were all suspicious of what we're doing because they would come and go at all times of the hours in strange-looking vehicles. But uh, that's the only thing that I felt firsthand that there was some resentment of what we were doing. And how important do you think the effort is to preserve these tests? Um, some people feel that if we don't preserve the documentation that we've made of them, that people will find an excuse to set off more bombs just to document them. Do you think it's important to preserve these tests that you help create? Uh, I think it's very important, yes, to, to preserve the, the, the records. But as far as additional testing, I think that uh, what we're doing is right, uh, that there should be a ban on further testing. Okay. And let me just, um, for, because you have been closer to, to atomic tests than just about anyone out there, can you describe sort of step by step the stages, how it feels to be very, very close to an atomic test? Well, you certainly could feel the excitement building up before a test. In fact, uh, on one, one uh, explosion out in the Pacific, 
at NOE Talk. They sent me out to shoot the bomb setup uh, just before the explosion. So we went out the day before. I remember having to climb a 200-foot tower, and uh, I, I've, I uh, covered the, uh, the weapon from different angles. And I remember taking out my Parker Jotter pen and taking my writing captions, and I left it right there at the bomb site. And I didn't realize it till later on uh, that night that I left my pen there. And next morning, it, it vaporized with the bomb. <laughs> so, what, so first there's a flash of light. And what, what are the stages oh, of the Oh, okay. Explosion? Well, first of all, the excitement builds up with the countdown. And the, you're, you're allowed to wear dark goggles or look away at, at, uh, at the time of uh, zero. And then after you guessed about uh, T plus three, you could look back towards the bomb, and you look at it, and here's this tremendous, it's, it's so bright. Everything around it is glowing. And I said, most of these weapons were fired right at, uh, at first light, and so it's still dark, and this, this sudden brightness. And then you can see a, a mushroom cloud developing, and you see it changing all different colors of red, orange, yellow, and I said ultraviolet, this ultraviolet color. And then you feel the bomb, the first shock wave. In fact, uh, over the waters, you could see it coming. You could see the shock wave coming, or out in the desert, you could see the sand uh, as it kicks up as the shock wave races towards you. And then it hits you like a ton of bricks, believe me. And a few seconds later, then you feel the reverse. You feel a wind behind you blowing towards the bomb blowing towards the blast. So you get it one way and then back the other way. Wow, and how about the and, sound? Uh, the sound at a shock wave is the one that, that really knocks you over. Uh, the, well, the shock wave you really feel first, and then the sound, the sound you hear later, the blast. You have to have just, just a sec couple of seconds. I'm sorry, do you have to have earplugs or something? Um, I don't remember wearing earplugs, no. Okay, no. okay. and... Um, what special difficulties does photographing nuclear ex uh, explosions cause? What special challenges are there for you as a photographer? Well, uh, probably the biggest challenge is what kind of exposure do you use? But really, you, whatever exposure you use, you're going to be okay because the light intensity goes way up and then it gradually d diminishes. So whatever you, your exposure is, it's going to be okay because somewhere in there it's going to be correct. Were you involved with any innovations in terms of documenting these events, uh, extended range film or anything like that? Uh, no, that was primarily done by EG and G. They did all these uh, very fancy type of film emotions. Um, okay, uh, 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 we, we were still rolling here. Yeah, we'll get but, it done. But uh, we had people at Lookout Mountain who are very, very innovative in developing camera platforms and different kinds of equipment, unique equipment, uh, for the atomic test. Finally, can you tell me what it was like to be part of sort of this, this mini uh, movie studio? I mean, is that what you, you all felt like? Were you a community? Oh, we were definitely a community. Uh, we had our own credit union, uh, so people could bank, because we were, like I say, up at Lookout Mountain uh, at Wonderland Avenue in the middle of a residential area. We had our own little cafeteria that we, we, we manned. And so, yes, we were very close, all of us. And, and did you have this sort of feeling that we were, you had a very difficult job and you were all in this together? Well, I, I, I know we, we all pulled for each other. I don't think there was any animosity or bitterness uh, of one group versus another. Uh, we, I think we worked very, very close to get each other. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. We had a camera bump on that. If you could give us one more time with that. Okay, sure. Um, we were family, and uh, we had an annex. So, so what uh, uh, was a, 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 it's your own community? Was it very much a very tight-knit group? I think so. I communicate still with quite a few of the, uh, the people there uh, from Lacan Mountain. And, uh, were you like a family? I, I think we were like a family, definitely. Okay. It's, look at it's, too, the whole time, it's too bad our three seconds of fame didn't come before this. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're so goddamn we're old, you, you can't. <laughs> we don't need it anymore. <laughs> we're speaking. Okay.
Okay, we're on tape now. Okay. Um, for identification purposes, can you uh, state and spell your name for us? Doug Wood, Douglas Wood, and it's W-O-O-D. And Douglas? D-O-U-G-L-A-S. Thank you. Um, can you tell us um, what uh, Lookout Mountain was as an organization and what you guys did? Well, it was an Air Force photographic mission that uh, we did everything to support the Department of Defense in photography, whatever they requested uh, from the Air Force for photography, we supported that. And we supported other arms of the government, uh, Army and Navy sometimes. Uh, for instance, on, on one of the tests, it was strictly a Navy thing, but the Navy hired the Air Force to do the job for them. And I was farmed out to the Navy for several months, like a year and a half, mm -hmm. of mostly working for the Navy. And what types of things did you photograph? Uh, on that particular one, it was an atomic test. And they put submarines underwater, put an atomic bomb underwater, and tried to see what the damage would be to a submarine at different distances from an atomic bomb. Did that answer the question? Yes. Great. Um, so wh um, why were these tests documented? What was the information used for? Who was, you know, were they using it to analyze something or? Yes, in some cases. Mostly the analytical type film was shot by a, an organization called EGG. It was Edgerton, Gurmischhausen und Greer was a company in uh, Boston and they did all the super high speed stuff with the with timing and everything. Ours was to document the events and we documented every scientific program and every military program uh, for the effects that were created by the weapon going off and then we made pictures and uh, uh, for the people who wanted them, plus the, they always made what they called a commander's report that was shown to Congress, and that's how they got the appropriations for future tests and, and for the programs that uh, made the scientific uh, discoveries and, the, and the, what happened to weapons and different things like that. Mm -hmm. And what was your role in specific at Lookout Mountain? I was a cameraman. Um, can you rephrase that, saying that I was a cameraman at Lookout Mountain? I was a cameraman at Lookout Mountain. And how many atomic um, explosions do you think you photographed throughout your time there? Uh, I, I'm not sure. They, uh, somebody was telling me the other day that there were probably 300 and some odd that were in the atmosphere. And I missed the first five that went off, was Crossroads and Sandstone. And then I missed a, several others because <clears throat> when you got too much radiation for that year, they sent you home. And I don't know how many times I was sent home, and I don't know how many weapons I missed, but I would say I probably saw 80% of them, uh, of the ones that went off, uh, maybe 90%. I, I, I haven't even a clue. <laughs> mm -hmm. now, we were talking to George earlier about being um, at ground zero to photograph an explosion? Well, uh, or? that was an explosion where the, the weapon was tethered on a balloon uh, at a given altitude and, and uh, they put people under it and photographed up, I guess. I, I wasn't on that one. Uh, but. Uh, were you ever in any, um, any situations where you were really close to an explosion that you were frightened or anything? No. I was never, fr uh, well, hey, I used to be frightened a lot, but, uh, you know, that was other things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how close would you be to? Normal at, 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 I started to say three other things. Okay. Normally at Mercury, Nevada, we were about four miles was the closest we would get to stand in the open and photograph them. 
we used to put cameras in steel containers much closer and run them remotely. But for people in the open, about as close as they'd allow you was four miles. And uh, maybe sometimes we could go a little closer if it was a small yield weapon, but I don't remember exactly. And with the big weapons in the Pacific, we would sometimes be as far as 20 miles. However, there were uh, some of the last big thermonuclear weapons that went off. Uh, I was f photographing uh, B-57s flying as close as they could, was four miles, and then we'd have to turn and fly away from it as rapidly as possible in that particular airplane to, so that when the shock wave got us, it wouldn't hit us broadside, would hit us tail on and give us a shove. Wow, you know. so let me make sure I understand this. So they would drop a bomb out of another plane, and you would be in a different plane photographing it? Oh, we. Uh, Can you tell? Um, no, I, I'm sorry. I I wasn't very good at that. Uh, whenever a bomb went off, we had usually two airplanes up, circling the target area, with camera racks mounted in the doorway, of which you can get a picture of later when you do that. Uh, I probably screwed that up for years. No, it's fine. Keep going. Tape. You're doing a great job. But, but what? Uh, on this particular test was uh, they painted some B-57s pure white, uh, all over white, so that they could find out if the thermal effects would affect the aircraft that was dropping a weapon or whatever. And so being pure white, they would reflect the most light. It was a shiny white paint, and, and we'd f fly close, broadside to the thing, get the heat and the shock, uh, I'm sorry, the heat, and then turn 90 degrees away from it. So he's flying here and I'm flying there and taking his picture and the fireball's in the background. And then we turn 90 degrees and go away from the shot. So when the shock wave caught us, it would be tail on to it. Um, can you explain to our audience what a shock wave is? I mean, not technically, but just what it is in terms of a bomb explosion. Well, when the bombs explode or when anything explodes, it sends out a pressure wave of, of uh, super air that, that's pushing. And, uh, and when it hits you, it's, uh, it's like getting shoved aside. Uh, if you're close enough, it, it pushes you. Uh, uh, if you were close enough, it would knock you over. And if you're a little closer, it would kill you. But <laughs> just the shock wave, uh, because, uh, for instance, uh, they used to use an expression, a flying toilet seat will kill you if the blast is pushing it hard enough. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, we're just, you know, uh, KTLA wants done, so we have another five minutes or so. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so can you tell us again, um, well, I know I asked you already, how far away from the explosions were you? It sounds like you shot them from planes, from also the ground. Yes. Um, what, what, can you tell me some of the different situations that, that you were that you photo that you were in photographing the explosions? Well, they had one uh, the second test I went on in 1951, where uh, <laughs> our writer <laughs> talked to the commander of the test and uh, was saying what kind of good shots we can make, and and uh, he said, well. Why, why can't we have an airplane follow behind the drop airplane and the following airplane will be directly over the blast when it goes off? And so then the boss said to me, he said, I got a good job for you. He said, you get in the nose of that airplane and take a picture of that bomb from right above it. So I did that four times. And the first time... <laughs> They'd say bombs away, okay, and then they give you a count of how long it's going to be before the bomb goes off. And you wear a pair of big goggles that were a rubber frame with a with a almost opaque lens in it, like a welding glass for arc welding. And I thought, well, I got to keep steering the camera until I get because the airplane's moving around and 
And so I'd have to keep moving the camera a little bit. And I said, well, I'll wait till minus one and then I'll put on my goggles. And so the count gets down to about three and I reach up and, and uh, it goes to two and I go to one and I rip the lens right out of the goggles. <laughs> it was a plastic lens. <laughs> the panic set in and I slapped my hand over my eyes and, and when the flash went off, I could see the bones in my <laughs> fingers. <laughs> from the, you know, other, I could see the red skin, uh, the, re the blood in my fingers, but you could see the dark spots where the bones were. Wow, that's incredible. That's, that's how bright it is. And we were at probably 20,000 feet above the blast, and then we saw the cloud come up towards us. And f just for your information, he has that shot out there someplace, and you can look at it. Um, so I know that this was highly classified work that you were doing. Yes. Um, did you ever, I mean, you got to see the footage or were you just filming it and then would turn no, it over we, to No, we usually got to see the footage when we got home, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the times in the Pacific, they would send the footage. We had a courier, would carry it in, get it processed, bring it back to us so we could see it and see what we were doing mm -hmm. right or wrong because we were usually out there three months, you know, sometimes longer. On the last test, I, I'd have to ask Kenny uh, because he'd remember it, but I wouldn't. Uh, but it seems to me uh, it took us almost eight months because they blew up. We, we were doing, besides the B-57s I told you about, we were doing high altitude shots in the stratosphere to see what the effects would be of an atomic blast at super high altitude. And they blew up, one of, the, one of the missiles blew up on the pad and then we had to repair the pad and then we had to go, all go back out there and months later and fix it, do it again. Okay. I screwed that one up, good. No, you're doing great. Um, I just have a couple more questions and then we'll be done, okay? Um, how did you get involved with Lookout Mountain? How did you get involved with this work? Well, I met these guys because the officers that started, that the officer who started Lookout Mountain went to SC Cinema School with eight other guys and he took them all up and started Lookout Mountain. And they worked on crossroads and sandstone before I ever got there. And then I worked on the very next test was called Greenhouse in, 50, in the spring of 51. And um, I had two friends that went on crossroads, one of whom is here tonight. And um, they were telling me about it. And, and then I heard that this, this organization that where I, oh, and I was working at Lockheed Aircraft, um, God start over again. I was working at Douglas Aircraft in their flight test division and the guys came down there from the SC Cinema to see what we were doing with high speed photography. And so I had met them and then I heard they were hiring and uh, to work on atomic tests and so I went up and applied for a job with them. And then I was uh, I, I ended up uh, as the head of the camera division after a while. Uh, I, 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 what is the most spectacular explosion you ever saw? Well, uh, there, there were so many of them that were spectacular, but the, the one that I remember was the very first thermonuclear one that Dr. Teller was just running a test on uh, before it was really a bomb, but it was a thermonuclear device. And, and uh, uh, I think that was probably the most spectacular one I remember because it was the first one. Oh. Uh, first thermonuclear. I'm sorry. Can you describe it at all? 
Now, you know, they're, they're big and they got all kinds of colors and they're done at dawn and, and uh, I, I don't know, actually, you know, the picture that Pete's got on, on the cover of his little uh, um, box that his show comes in, that's a spectacular one. Uh, they're, they glow and they're red and they're still putting out light long after the main blast is over with. Uh, the, the initial light from the nuke is uh, 